Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains maddening. And today, we're going to discuss more elements of mad science. <laughs> and yes, of course, we're talking about trains again. These are five trains that were clearly just mad science experiments. Part four! Foden. Excuse me, Foden. Um, you have a, you have a, what, what is going on with you? Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Foden was the name for a 420 steam locomotive that, well, I, it, it almost isn't a steam locomotive at all. It's a rail tractor that was based off of a steam lorry. It was rebuilt to run on rails and given a chain drive. You know, like a bike, which is, is is something that isn't unheard of when it comes to rail technology, but um, it, it's not used that often. <laughs> she ran on a narrow gauge tramway, the Bedesert Shire Tramway, that was in Queensland, Australia. She was definitely an amalgamation of a bunch of different pieces and definitely a bizarre experiment, but she actually did all right, all things considered. They only needed her to shunt small things around, and a chain drive, I mean, it's not a great decision, but if all she's doing is the bare minimum in terms of shunting duties, you can get away with that. A sturdy enough chain will do you just fine. She was never very fast or very strong, but she did what they needed them to do, and for not that much cost investments. It's believed they already had the steam lorry anyway. They just rebuilt it. So, hey, more power to her, I suppose. It's not really known what happened to her, though, given she's no longer around, I think it can be assumed that she's been scrapped. <laughs> The Staten Jansvega SJA 1474 Turbinlock. Sweden. Sweden, I just got done, just, just a few weeks ago, discussing how you actually made steam turbines work. What the heck is that? Why are the drivers behind the... That's not where those are... I should probably be thanking my Discord server for pretty much all of these. Uh... These were mostly suggestions from them, so thanks you guys. And for this one in particular, special thanks to the rough translation, since any source about this particular locomotive seems to be in Swedish, which I can barely read, let alone understand. According to what limited information we have, the drivers were in that position because it consisted of a boiler wagon with a steam boiler, as well as the cab, plus a machine wagon with a steam turbine in it. It had a condenser in the tender, but apparently the tender contained that and water. The coal was actually kept in the front next to the boiler. So it's a tank engine, even though it doesn't look like it. It basically can't function without the tender at all. It needs it. I mean, most tender engines do need their tenders, but this one really needed it. And I guess they put the drivers there because that's where they thought most of the weight would be? But, um, okay. There's just so many things that don't make sense about that. For one thing, as the water dissipates, you're gonna have less weight on those drivers. Logistically, the boiler in the front would always have a significant weight on it, unless the condenser in the tender was really that heavy. And it may have been, that's possible, but this is still just absurd. And there's a reason the design was never repeated. Not only was it really late, it took them five years to put it together for whatever reason, because it was first ordered in 1922 and wasn't delivered till 1927, it was discontinued very quickly, because it never was reliable at any point. It broke all the time, 
based off of what we know, and the technology was incredibly complicated as you no doubt have noticed, so yeah, it, uh, it just didn't really work. I'm not even sure what the wheel arrangement would be for this thing. Some people are saying that it would be a 406, which doesn't make any sense at all. But under the white notation, you aren't supposed to include the wheels on the tender, but the tender is a part of the locomotive. It would technically be a tank engine because of how integral it is to the function. So I guess, looking at it, you would say it's a 1064? I can't even believe I had to say that. I, I, I don't even know, okay? I don't. Why 109? The thing. Yeah, that's a thing, all right. Isn't that just a boxcar? Or maybe a cattle car? No. No. No, it isn't. It's a locomotive. Yes, really. Y109 was originally built by the Phoenix Foundry Ballarat as one of Victorian Railway's Y classes, 060 steam locomotives. She serves faithfully in that form for many years, but during the end of her working life, she was sold to an industrial company, Brunswick Plaster Mills, who then employed her hauling gypsum from the Rock Plain to the VR Interchange siding at Nwingi. For some reason, they decided in 1956 to convert her entirely from steam to a diesel mechanical locomotive. What? They removed her boiler and mounted a diesel engine and a transmission on the frame. Then they mounted a sort of shed over the whole thing to provide a cabin for the crew. She worked in the technical sense in that form, but that's the reason why she was called the thing. You converted a steam engine to diesel mechanical? Because reasons I just, yo. I mean, imagine this in the context of Thomas the Tank Engine. Hello, 109. How are you doing today? This one's suffering is eternal. 109, are you all right there? I have lived past the point of death. Entered in a world of purgatory. Of unending suffering. 109, we, we have to get to work. You do this every day. Come on now, kill me. KILL ME! Eventually, she was acquired by Steam Rail Victoria and relocated to their depot. Believe it or not, she's actually still in preservation now, because she's so weird. She was returned to the Murray Malay District for display in Millowa Pioneer Park. She was restored by volunteers and actually looks pretty nice now, all things considered, given what a ridiculous creation she is. So I guess that's nice. I see now I only exist to be gawked at, to be stared at, the misfit, the freak, the thing. Let my torment end. The Organ in California A. What? How did the- wait, this is a- did they take an engine and just squish it? Cause that's what that looks like. So this is a perplexing locomotive that is not necessarily one of a kind, but very few of these were built. This is a return flu locomotive. Now what the heck does that even mean? Well, in a normal fire tube boiler, the gas and smoke pass through tubes in the boiler and exhaust out the smoke box and smokestack at the front. You probably already knew that when it comes to steam locomotives. But in a return flu, the gas and smoke pass through the boiler to the front and then back again through U-shaped tubes. They go all the way back to the rear of the boiler and go through a smokestack that's actually in the cab. Now why in the blue heck would you ever want to do that? Well, the thing about the smoke exiting in the front of a locomotive is that the smoke has to go back when the locomotive is moving forward and that can cause it to go in the crew's faces, which is, you know, annoying. A return flu avoids that by having the smoke exit above them, and thus sparing them the smoke in the face thing, but it did create other problems. For one thing, return flues were just more complicated to construct, and having U-shaped tubes took up more space in the boiler, and in a way could be less efficient since the exhaust was cooler coming back, 
But the biggest issue I find with them is the tremendous discomfort the crew would face in this type of locomotive, which is hilarious because the point was to actually increase their comfort, and yet having the smoke box and the stack in the cab would make things tremendously hot. Like a steam locomotive cab is already notoriously pretty hot because that's what the firebox is, but now so is the smoke box. Everything is back there. The heat in the cab must have been excruciating. This type of design naturally did not take off, as crews were willing to deal with the occasional smoke in the face over a constant risk of heat stroke. This particular model is believed to have been scrapped. The McKean Railweed Burners. What? No. No, you're not intentionally starting fire. Oh, no. Union Pacific, no! Well, in 1907, Union Pacific Railway, at their Omaha shops, under the supervision of one Mr. W.R. McKean Jr., who was superintendent of motor power and machinery, put together a gasoline burner and attached it to a rail car. And it can move under its own power, too. As the name would suggest, the railroad was dealing with an overabundance of weeds on their lines. So naturally, the logical conclusion is to incinerate them with the heat of a thousand suns. And it saw significant use on branch lines. The car is made of steel and it was mounted on a four wheel truck. It was actually propelled by gasoline as well. It can move at a top speed of 15 miles an hour, though in practice, in order to actually get the job done, it only moved about four or five miles an hour. They used compressed air to force the gasoline to the burners that were situated at the rear of the car, near the ground. The rail car's frame itself forced the weeds down, and then the burner, well, burned them. Three men were required to operate this blasted thing, and yeah, this was a thing that actually existed. And believe it or not, this is not the only example of this madness. It's just the earliest one that I am aware of. Because Australia did this too, utilizing tech from leftover World War II flamethrowers. Yes, really! Now the problem with doing this at all is, um, well, it involves the use of fire. And, you know, brush fires are a thing. And... It just seems to me that perhaps intentionally starting these fires might not be the best call. Um, it's generally a frowned upon practice when it comes to weed control. Like, I get the necessity here. I, I get why they thought this was a good idea. But not only is it kind of inefficient to do it this way, but the risk of causing a wildfire is very real. And, and Smokey the Bear does not approve of this particular methodology. Australia seems to still have some of theirs in preservation, as theirs were smaller and unpowered. They were pushed by another locomotive. Union Pacific's earlier edition, though, seems to be lost to time. I found no record of it being preserved in any way. They were likely all scrapped. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Some do 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Benjamin Owens, Spencer Kitsu, 131, just 232, Mr. Black Rose, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Drop of the Foon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust the Third, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Rover Videos, Hayden DeGrow, Master of None, Dr. Racer 78, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Hoth 444, Alaric Jaspers, The Baxter, That Guy with a Beard, NG5, Mark Holding, Mercenary Revy, Lock Kraken, Crystal Morgan, and A Person 723. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.